Manassas Foundation. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Greetings. This is Paul Holden Graber, your host for the Quarantine Tapes, brought to you by Onassis, LA, and Dublin. I am thrilled to announce that we have asked various former Quarantine Tape guests to host during a week guests of their own choice in total freedom. They have absolute carte blanche on their choices. This week I have asked Eddie Glaude, the distinguished university professor in the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University to be our host. Eddie Glaude is the author, most recently, of the extraordinary study on James Baldwin, entitled Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. I hope you will enjoy these quarantine tapes. So I'm so delighted to have the opportunity to talk to and talk with the wonderful Sarah Broom, the author of The Yellow House, the winner of the 2019 National Book Award. So first of all, before we get into anything in particular, how are you holding on in the midst of this craziness, this madness that is COVID in the United States? I, I don't actually know the answer to that question because I feel that I'm in some sort of strange interstitial space which is where I feel most comfortable and really like to live. But when I'm in this kind of interstitial space, it takes me a long time to know exactly how I'm doing, you know? And I think right now I'm so observant, you know, this way that you find yourself being so watchful. I'm so watchful and I'm noting everything and figuring out what's collapsing and what seems to be building back up. So I don't know exactly how I am. Well, well, that makes sense. I mean, you're so damn observant. Details seem to come to you so easily in so many ways. Are you writing? How are you writing? Are you, are you putting words, sentences on the page in the midst of all of this? You know, I'm trying. I'm writing some, a few new things that are outside of genre, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm reading a ton of art books. You know, I was, I'm reading um, a book about Sam Gilliam and I'm reading um, uh, Amanda Williams and and her color theory. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, um, you know, thinking a lot about Thornton Dial and I'm sort of living with the visual artist. It's amazing that you say that because I was thinking about you as, as, you know, as I want to do sometimes and particularly because of this conversation. And I was thinking about the Yellow House, and and I, we're going to talk about more than the book because I can only imagine how much you've talked about the Yellow House since <laughs> since it came out. But I was just thinking about it, and I was thinking about it, in, at, you know, in in terms of painting, mm. and 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 how thickly layered the the book is with detail. And you know, Jack Whitten came to mind, and in Pasta <laughs> Technique, where you know you have this thick layering of paint where it almost rises off the it all rises off the canvas, you know. And so, talk a little bit about the visual arts and and how how it shape how they shape the way you sit down and and approach the page, as it were. You know, it's interesting because I have these visual artist friends who who also live in upstate New York, where I am sometimes. And, and I've gone quite often into their studio to try to think about painting. Mm-hmm. And my painter friend, Joan Snyder, said to me many, many years ago that for her, so much of painting is learning how to 
how to load a brush, right? Wow. And I was thinking very much of Sam Gilliam, and he talks about, you know, a teacher saying to him many, many years ago that, you know, you respect the paint too much. That's the problem with you. You're too precious about the paint. And so I think of what I love about painting in, in particular is also the way in which it contains all of these layers. Mm -hmm. And it just feels like you have to learn this delicacy because you can be very heavy handed, right? As, as the newly, the new driver pressing on the gas and, and, and sort of going out of control. But, but there's also this deafness that you have to learn and a kind of subtlety, you know, um, and you have to know how to load the brush, what to load the brush with, yeah. the weight of the brush, yeah. you know, I don't actually know how to do any of these things. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm just trying, you know, I'm like trying to make myself sound all intelligent. You know, I, I don't know anything about this sort of stuff. I it's Besides talking with Imani Perry. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, I, I actually describe my revising technique as, as a kind of fanning technique. Right. So, it, you know, it's like when I revise my writing, I'm, it's like taking a stroke and then moving it and trying mm -hmm. to see what comes. And I'm doing that all the time. Right. And I call it, I just intuitively, I'm fanning out. I'm trying to figure out how to, what this will look like as I work my way through it. So I just thought it was just really fascinating that you would open up with, with that <laughs> as I was thinking about the yellow house as this kind of thickly textured text, you know? And you know, something about yellow and, um, you know, the color, I mean, it makes me think so much of Amanda Williams and her color theory. And, you know, she went and painted these houses on the south side of Chicago, these mm -hmm. Pantone, and, you know, it was like hair grease and named after, you know, all the stuff Black people instantly recognize. And this uh, this idea of yellow, which uh, the painter Buford Delaney, yeah. um, you know, just <laughs> looking at the work of Buford and thinking of Baldwin and Begin Again is somewhere here on my desk. You see and, where Yellow House is. <laughs> you know, I know, you, you've sold a lot of copies for me. Um, but, but Buford Delaney and um, Van Gogh talking about mm -hmm. yellow as the color of divine clarity and mm -hmm. just thinking about the tools that we all have, especially in this particular time as Black people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what it means to sort of think about color, to be people of color and of texture, mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out how to survive in a world that seems to keep wrapping in on itself. You know, I, I, I love that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to shift for a moment, but, you know, I think, I think like that about the color blue. Mm. You know, I have blue glasses. I wear blue ties. I, it's my favorite. It's the color where I had, I feel most comfortable. It's, you know, maybe it's, you know, growing up and it's my, my birthstone, you know, all from. But yeah, I was going to say, what is it about blue, you think? I don't, it, it's a calming space for me. It's a space that allows, um, allows me to, 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 to feel the expansiveness of, of what's going on in my head, right? Mm. Where things aren't closing in. Right? Mm. but it's actually moving out. So whenever I'm in blue, I feel free, if, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But let me ask you this question. We're both from the Gulf Coast. You're from, New Orleans is even distinct mm -hmm. in terms of the Gulf Coast, you know, but it, you know, it casts this shadow mm -hmm. uh, eastward and westward. You know, you could feel it if you're in Houston, you can feel it if you're in Mobile, right? Um, what is it, how do you imagine yourself as a writer from a place like New Orleans? You said in the book that, you know, you know the New Orleans humidity is a mood. Mm -hmm. And I just have a feeling that, you know, and I know that mood, Lord mm -hmm. have mercy, I do. <laughs> um, so talk a little bit about what it means to be a writer from the Gulf Coast and more specifically from New Orleans. And how does that shape and inform the way you approach the page? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it's interesting because um, I met Natasha Trethaway for the first time last year and, and meeting her was, I had met her through her work, but actually physically meeting her, we just grabbed each other. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we said was, we should go on a road trip 
we should go on like a Gulf Coast road trip. And that moment matters so much to me because it was sort of the first time when I got to sort of physically place myself in this firmament of women, black women writers Mm -hmm. who are are actively working now and who matter so much to me. And so when I think of being a writer from the Gulf Coast, it's very immediate for me now because I think of us as kind of guides along the way, right? Um, Revising a narrative um, of what it means to be American Mm -hmm. Um, from this very specific place. And I'm always very conscious when, um, you know, some place along the Gulf Coast is left out of this story that's being told, right? And so to be from New Orleans, uh, being one of the places that is so drowned in mythology that, that isn't even really allowed to be a place that actually belongs to natives because it's so uh, obfuscated Mm -hmm. in all of these drapings that have nothing to do with its true self. I, I, I think that in certain ways, it's, it's something I've heard you speak about many times and it becomes about this current moment, right? That as a writer, that is the place that has made me. So therefore, I belong to it and it belongs to me. It has produced me. That is part of my Americanness, my Southernness and my queerness, mm-hmm. all of those things. And I'm in this position of trying to get out of, out from under the story, actually, to, to, to live elsewhere, to not be suffocated by it. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that 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 I've been kind of grappling with, and you know, inspired by your work in so many ways, um, uh, and Natasha Trethewey's work, um, to kind of delve into my own kind of uh, formation. And one of the striking things about home for me is the silences. Are the silences mm-hmm. right? Just I remember the house being. There's a lot of noise when my father yelled, but there were but the silence was actually much more prevalent. Mm. What wasn't being said. And I, you know, when I'm reading that, when I was reading the yellow house, there are these moments when your mother would just shut it down. Mm-hmm. There are moments in, and you know, you were, you were a handful. As she says, you were born in distress mm. as it were, <laughs> and remained that way afterwards, <laughs> as she put it. But there, there are all of these silences. And I'm wondering what those silence are those i don't think those silences are unique to the gulf coast but they may very well be a feature of the landscape because i feel them also in jasmine ward's writing oh god yes oh as my god. something that's not being said and you know uh, in in memorial drive the silences are as are as loud as as whatever sentence on the, the beautiful sentences is on the page what do you think about that you know that is it really because that goes to the actual architecture of the place is how I see it, you know, mm-hmm. that, that and that's why I'm so interested in the underbellies and all the texture under the ground. Cause I, I just think the history, the, the gener- the actual lineage, the actual accumulation of traces is so particularly mighty and so particularly salient and just buried in the wood and in and everything that has been built in the soil and you know mixed in with all of the sort of american toxins yeah. is this sort of southern conjuring rootness that i think that's why i am so obsessed with land and feel so tethered it's it's a kind of homesickness that i i i don't even i feel like no one can express it the way a southern person can somehow it's it's like a primal um psychic and spiritual um sense that we have of what it means to be 
moored and then unmoored yeah. and to be in temporary home, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to be migrating and displaced. And I, I don't know, it just, I think I've never quite encountered it. And, and so many of those visual artists I mentioned are Southern right. and, you know, Imani Perry and all these, you and all of these greats, Kiesi Lehman, Jasmine Ward, this woman, Juanita Harrison, mm. do you know her? No. She wrote my great, um, wide, beautiful world. It's like this black woman from Mississippi who wrote a travelogue that actually Imani Perry told me about. Uh, she traveled the world. It's, it's a book that you can, you know, you work hard to find, but it exists. So it's sort of like, these women, these men from this place who are in touch with something so deep, so spiritual, that is essentially, right, the heart of what it means to belong to this place. Right, exactly. The disregarded often heart. And because we know, it's like when you, you know, it's like when I'm in Harlem, you know, and white people look nervous around black people, the black people pay more attention, right? They're like, yeah. hey, what are you scared of? <laughs> so it's sort of like, it's the South, right? It's like, okay, so we're like the disregarded heathen child. Right. Well, we're going to come back to you a hundredfold yeah. in our velocity and power and strength. Right. What do you so think? I think that's absolutely right. You know, I've been trying to figure it out, right? I've been trying to figure it out at, at the level of, of rhythm and pitch, right? Trying to, trying mm -hmm. to, you know, think about the way in which uh, the South orients me to the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, how it allows me to um, see differently. You know, mm -hmm. it's like Jimmy says that when, you know, he, he knew he had to go to the South. He was afraid to go to the South, but he knew he had to go. And it was revelatory, right? It's this revelation. And when he left it, you know, he was, ex you know, so full of fear. You know, you, I got this image of him getting off the, uh, getting, going to the uh, uh, train and all of his luggage just popping open, so full of 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 not just simply clothes and and material things, but just full of it, the experience mm -hmm. of moving through the region, you know, mm -hmm. that it's over couldn't be contained, right? And, and trying to figure out how to 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 translate that to give voice to it. That's why I was fascinated by your your, your you know you mentioned that you had this habit of writing down conversations. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, because that because you began with your attention to detail, right? We're in the midst of this madness, and and you paying attention to everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> and everything. Talk a little bit about this habit of writing people's convo. Oh, I know some folk were like, "What are you doing? What am I doing? I would be doing it now if if you know if <laughs> I weren't so interested in in this what was happening in this conversation. I think so. I I really understand character and through sound and how people put sentences together, it matters so much to me. And I, I'm always worried that if I don't write a conversation down, I, I won't remember tempo and I won't remember pause space, um, a, a certain accumulation of experience that appears in the way somebody talks. Um, and. I just don't, you know, even if I were writing a novel, perhaps I would want to use actual dialogue from all of these conversations as opposed to making it up. Because I don't think there's anyone, I, I, and I talk to a lot of people, you know, I'm one of those telephone people. Oh, and, no. and, and, I, and I just love the way people talk. It's my main way into some understanding of another human being, mm. you know? And, and I'm also, I think on some level, quite trained by my mother to look out for the poets who nobody has called the name of or calls a poet, you mm. know? Um, and 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 I just belong to this world where where people are very vested in how they tell stories. But this was also the case when I was in Cambodia for some time, and also in Burundi. You know, I was writing down because of the way people said things. So I think that's my entry 
And then it allows me a kind of rhythmic experience of someone, mm. which I think is valuable. You know, I, I, I'm thinking about, you know, when you said that you were a telephone person, it reminds me of my great grandmama. Uh, we called her Mama. Oh, she could make the yeah, hell out of some pinto that. beans. And Mama would sit down every time the phone rang, and she had the phone. It was one of those old pho- rotary phones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was on the wall. It was on the wall, and mm-hmm. it was right next to the window. And she had a little seat, and she would sit on that little seat and open the curtain and hold that big phone and just talk. And it, oh. it's just, it was just amazing to witness. She wasn't looking at anything in particular. Oh, wow. um, she was just looking as she as she held as she had the conversation. Wow. But so there's a way in which you're attentive to language, you're attentive to uh, gesture, you're attentive to attentive to uh, the kind of embodied way in which words are spoken. Mm-hmm. You have to be if you're in the South. It seems to me. Oh yes. Um, what does it mean? Talk about, you mentioned this, I mean, you tell this, I mean, it's it's a profound part of the yellow book, but you didn't, you didn't, the world, the world was blurry, blurry for you for 10, up up until you were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to tell your mama, oh, trees got leaves. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Talk about what that meant for 10 years to see the world in the way that you did. And then. You know, I was thinking about that passage with Jesus and Jesus, that 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 uh, that miracle where Jesus touches the man, uh, the blind man and the man. He says, well, what did you see? And the man says, I see people, but they look like trees. <laughs> and then he says, well, no, you got to get another touch. <laughs> he touches him again so he can get I a clear vision. So he can get a clear vision. Talk a little bit about what it meant for your formative years, for 10 years, for the world to for the world to come to you like that. You know, this was sort of. Uh, bizarre for me because I was a child who liked to get out and go places in my diaper. You know, there are all these pictures of me barefoot in a diaper, like coming from across the street, you know, like it, it clearly I had gone someplace and I'm in diaper age. And at times I have something in my hand, like I found something and the picture, the photographer's just taking a photo of me in this state. And so to think that that's the child I was and I couldn't see for half the time, Mm. you know, um, you know, I'm really interested in this. And I think this has made me into a more sensual, sensual person because I, without my sight, and I just remember feeling a little robbed of something, but I couldn't tell if that was environmental you know, like I was one of 12 children and not enough attention was being paid or, you know, the air was too thick, Mm. but not seeing it. I was using all my other senses, right? In the time when I couldn't see. And I I didn't, it, it created in me a kind of fear, which I think I still have to this day because I felt that I couldn't prepare for the unknown, um, because too many things became the unknown, because I I couldn't see, you know, five steps in front of me or five feet in front of me. And, you know, I write about that, that even my brothers jumping out would just make me uh, so in terror, you know, Um, and, and I couldn't see people I should ordinarily know, right, you know, right. I, I could definitely couldn't see at school. So I was in perpetual danger because I didn't know, you know, in a wild school when someone was getting too close to me or taking something or um, it, it made me a little hesitant, I think. Mm. But what I really loved about writing is that only writing allows us to look back on that on that time and say and and make meaning of it and say this somehow fed into the person I am now but then also the fact that I pay so much attention that I will never ever take for granted the shape of a a leaf on any tree ever again (laughs) and now I want to see my mother said you know you never wanted to take a nap after you got glasses you were just perpetually awake you know um and and so I thought um, in terms of structure, right? I mean, you know this. It gave me this sort of wonderful moment to actually have an arc as a character. 
and to explain myself in a way that wasn't, you know, and then on the 12th of August, I, you know, um, and, and, and just to, to talk honestly about what you write about and begin again, ha having to do with wanting to look away, wanting to believe the lie, wanting to not go there and how hard it is to keep your glasses on mm. when you're afraid to see how these behaviors are so deeply internalized, you right. know? Right. There, there, there is this sense though that, that, you know, I mean, you began by talking about paying attention to detail and here mm -hmm. you are the mm -hmm. arc of the character, someone who suddenly is able to see paying attention to every leaf, paying attention to every, every detail uh, in, in word, in language rather. Um, there's a sense in which at the level of form, you do the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's something, I mean, one way to describe, you know, not the world coming to you in a blur with, in a blur is to be misfitted. Right. And so, mm -hmm. There's this sense in which you just don't give a damn about the form of the memoir. Uh, <laughs> the book is this extraordinary, right, social history, this attentiveness to, uh, from zoning law to, 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 you know, gentrification to, you know, this, the interdynamics of, of the family to being the 12th child, right? I mean, all of this is happening at once. And then I came across this line, you know, I'm this Baldwin guy, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, she says, whoa, that's, damn, that's deep. Jimmy taught me to follow the crooked places, mm -hmm. right? To, I mean, so to follow that crooked line of thought, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you put it. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how you inhabit form. Mm -hmm. How do you enact, right, uh, this insistence on seeing in the way that you see, following that crooked line of thought. Talk a little bit about that for me, because I learned so much, Sarah, just, just watching you do it. Wow, thank you. Um, you know, another thing James Baldwin talks about is um, that deep water and drowning are not the same thing. And, and that, um, you know, the questions are more important than the answers. And that was sort of my guiding force, which is that if I could make a book that is essentially questions strung together, and I never quite answer them, but I go on a road to think about them and then they make me think of another question. And then that question, you know, unravels yet more for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking a lot about, for instance, Lucille Clifton's generations and how a poet might tell us something about a world indirectly and build into um, the structure of the poem itself, um, a kind of texture, you know? And I didn't want to be a single or s singular self in this work. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I wanted to make something which felt like Black experience to me. And I, I thought, for instance, what could I tell the reader? Okay, if the reader hears me in all my pitches, high, low, middle, all my registers, mm -hmm. then how does it complicate things to hear Carl in all his registers, to hear my mother in all her registers, and to think, oh, that woman made that voice. That woman made those voices. Um, that we could, there could be some kind of rhetorical and interesting play having to do with language built into the structure itself and the choices I was making. So I, I guess like now as a writing person, I'm maybe I'll have to get your advice on this off the call, but it's just like, okay, but how do we keep making things as you did, right? With like, okay, I don't know how to tell, like think alongside Baldwin. So I have to like come up with some new approach to that, <laughs> right? Um, and so it's like, this is what we're doing, right? We are making a different boat 
right. for every journey we're, we're going on. We're trying to. Right. Uh, and so I, I think in terms of Baldwin and the crooked line, you know, I, it is the journey. It is the journey. It is how, it, you know, what do we know about the black woman wanderer? Do we know? Oh, what do we know? Question. What do we know? Oh my, that's such a great question, right? From Cambodia to Burundi to Berlin to Hong what Kong. To, <laughs> what and, and and we never and you know and I and I'm just in my little room upset because I all the stories appear, and you know the men write about manliness without women in the stories, which mm-hmm. makes me wild with fury you know how is this possible exactly yeah to write yeah. a male story with no women in it and so i i wanted to have this child walking down the street growing up but i didn't want to just write that story mm-hmm. you know cuz then i would be out of context and displaced and you know so it's like how to also write a book in which these people are not being displaced all again. over again. Yeah. And that we tend to the to their complexity, you know, at every level. At every level. And we and we are okay with slowing it down. I mean, you know, this happens often in film where, you know, a certain filmmaker can have a 20-minute opener, you know, where nothing happens. But, you know, we go in and make our films and, you know, we need to get to the heart of the story in 15 minutes. Yeah. And what I wanted to say was, no, I'm making this. So when I make it, we go real slow at first. 100 pages before you show up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, there's this quotation of Jelly Roll Morton where he says, you know, play it slow, sweet, and with plenty rhythm. Mm. And okay. you, actually tell, you actually tell us that in that moment when you're in the French Quarter and that dude is telling you that story and you try to get him, come on now, come, come, come on. <laughs> Come on, bring it on. Now. Yes, get exactly. <laughs> it's like, you got to get some patience up in that's here. That's right. <laughs> slow yourself, slow your roll. Yeah, that's wonderful. So look, I, I, I could talk to you all day, but I have to ask you as a way of moving, not to a point of closure, but ch- just an ellipses. These are crazy times. And as writers out of the tradition out of which we come, that we self-identify with, we have to bear witness, of course, in these moments. And uh, you have your wine, I have my Jameson. Mm-hmm. What are you feeling as, as a witness, right? As you take in the madness, I'm going back to where we began, mm-hmm. uh, of the political moment. And how does that come to you as an artist, as a writer, as we try to give voice to what we need to hear mm. moving forward, if that makes sense? I mean, it's so interesting because I, too, have been meditating on and thinking a lot about Baldwin precisely because that shift he makes, right, um, from from sort of pleading with to simply saying, y'all get it together, but I still have work to do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> is, is sort of where I find myself. Um, we are making art for each other and for our survival. And if we can, in this world, link up, see each other, find space for each other, egg each other on, you know, um, make things that give us and bring us joy that are intimate to us and make us feel something. I think that's more than enough. I'm really, really done with these expectations for myself, which are a thousand times more outsized than the most mediocre white person you've ever met. I think that is part of um, the plan and, and, and it is part of, I think, what can feel so devastating when you're trying to, to shake someone into understanding. And so now I'm, I'm just done with all of that. And, and I want to be in touch with my friends and I want to say, hey, you got through today? That's brilliant. Mm-hmm. You wrote a sentence? That's great too. But, but to also just understand that art is made from life. And so how do we encourage 
a, a kind of life that has meaning and purpose on a very small level in our personal worlds and in the worlds of the people we love. That's where I am now. Well, that's where we, I think we all need to be in so many ways. <laughs> well, it has been such a pleasure to, to just dialogue with you. Um, just a little bit of home. Oh my God. A Isn't little bit. This little? was amazing. <laughs> It's amazing. A lot of home, actually. A lot of home, actually. So I appreciate you. And, you know, you take care of yourself in Thank the midst you. of all you of this. Too. You too. Please so, do. Indeed. Okay. And thanks indeed. for your work. No, thank you. Take thank care. You. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com slash support.